Hi everybody and thank you for joining our webinar this month. We're going to talk about joint health. Um, in particular, we're going to talk about uh, Optimum Flex, High Victory, Yucca, Herbal Respond, the DAC products. But before we start talking about particular products, what I actually want to talk about is the joint. Because I think if we understand the joint better and all of the intricate parts of it, then we have a better understanding of why certain ingredients might be incorporated into a joint supplement and why when I make statements like I would like to see a combination of ingredients versus just one, why I might say things like that. So we'll go ahead and really dig in and have a good look at the joint and all of the different parts um, of the joint. I thought this was really neat as I was putting this together. You know, it's so easy to think of the knee and the hock like maybe the elbow and the and your knee, but this was th this is a really neat way of showing the horse's joints in relation to our joints. So the horse's shoulder being right up here, its elbow being here, the knee is actually a, equivalent to our wrist, the fetlock being more like one of our knuckles, and the foot being the end of our middle finger because this kind of from here down is um, kind of the old foot um, that had multiple toes on the um, really old horse, primitive horse. And then on the hind leg, you can see, yes, okay, the hip up where our hip is, the stifle being the knee, hock more like the ankle, and then the middle toe is the hoof. So I just thought that was neat to kind of get a bit of an idea on our own bodies um, where we're associating these joints. So I know some of this may seem a little uh, basic, but I think it's really important to go through um, piece by piece and really understand the joints again so that we understand why we might feed certain supplements um, and, and why we make certain statements about those supplements. So a joint's defined as a structure which joins two or more bones to form a single and anatomic entity. So there are several types of joints. There's fibrous joints, um, which these are like the, the uh, bits that connect um, your skull bones. Because you know, any of you that have had children, you know when your baby's born that those skull bones are separated and there's a lot of cartilage in there. Um, and so those fibrous joints need to um, fill in and get a lot more bone to fill in those fibrous areas. But So that's what's holding all your skull um, bones in your skull together. Then you have these cartilaginous joints. Well, most of us probably like to eat ribs. And so, you know, when you get to the end of some ribs, there's that cartilage joint and that is what is joining those ribs to the sternum. Uh, the synovial joints are joins two or more bones to form a movable, movable articulation or what we all would more likely consider a joint. So a synovial joint, a synovial joint, um, these would be the ones that we're really trying to um, affect when we feed a joint supplement. So there are multiple different components to a joint. And when we feed a joint supplement, we've got to take into account all of these different components. That's why there's multiple ingredients in a joint supplement. So, you know, we have on the outside, we have this synovial membrane. Well, really, at the joint capsule is on the outside. And then we have the synovial membrane, so joint capsule, then this darker pink synovial membrane. And then there's that synovial fluid in here. Then we have this articular cartilage here, or later on we'll also use the term hyaline cartilage, this cartilage here. And then we have that subchondral bone. Um, so outside, we've got the joint capsule and then synovial membrane, synovial fluid, cartilage, and then bone. These are all components that make up those synovial joints. 
Um, very important, the synovial membrane is really, really important to normal joint health. It's kind of holding everything in there. It's loose layers of cells on the inner portion of the joint capsule and it's permeable. Now that's really important because when people say, well, if you orally feed a joint supplement, it's not going to be able to get into the actual joint. That synovial membrane is permeable and those ingredients can get into the joint. Um, so again, this here, this is the periosteum. This is kind of going all the way around the joint. Um, we've got this fibrous capsule, the synovial membrane. That's that articular hyaline cartilage and then that bone there. So that synovial membrane, it's really, really important because there is no blood vessels in the cartilage. So how does food or nutrients and oxygen get to that actual cartilage? Well, it's because that synovial membrane lies very closely to blood vessels in the joint capsule. And that then, and because it's permeable, that can filter those nutrients into the synovial fluid and then feed that cartilage. It also is responsible for synthesizing hyaluronic acid. Now we've all heard about hyaluronic acid and how important it is, is several different roles for hyaluronic acid. But as I always say, the joint, if it's healthy, will make a lot of these ingredients that we put in joint supplements by itself. Hence my hesitation if you're just having a horse at maintenance and you don't necessarily want it to get a joint, any joint problems, so we start feeding it all of these joint supplements, then what actually happens is the body's own synthesis of hyaluronic acid will slow down and sometimes even stop because it's or it's act, it's able it's fe it's consuming it in the diet the joint is recognizing it so it actually shuts down its own production we look at that uh, synovial membrane a little closer so we've got this blood vessel here on the outside laying very closely to the edge of that synovial membrane where we've got these synovocytes and then here's that synovial fluid in here and so this here this blood vessel this layer here is very permeable and it's taking nutrients from that blood vessel putting it into the synovial fluid and then that synovial fluid is feeding those nutrients into that cartilage because the cartilage itself as mentioned does not have its own blood supply and we can look a little deeper so there's layers of that cartilage zone and I am really focusing a lot on the cartilage because that's where a lot of the failures occur is in the cartilage whether that cartilage is chipping off or it's being compressed um, it's not being fed that we have most of our issues in the cartilage but it's got three zones that we talk about superficial zone is right up close to that um, synovial fluid then we have this transitional zone here in the middle and then the deep zone down here and you can see that the chondrocytes look different kind of long and thin here fatter and more spread apart and then very much more organized here in that deep zone and here we have the calcified cartilage zone because cartilage is continually turning over and turning into bone or hyaline cartilages and then we have that sub subchondral bone underneath there now i'll point this out very quickly but we'll talk about it a little bit more later when we talk about hyaluronic acid you've heard me say that hyaluronic acid is one of the most important ingredients in a joint supplement and at certain levels and the reason being is that it is the backbone that holds together your chondroitin your glucosamine your other proteoglycans it's this backbone strand here those other ingredients are the bottle brush we'll get to that a little bit later um, but think about also when you compress the bone when you have this exercising horse pounding along and that that joint we know that that joint is a shock absorber 
And a lot of us think that it's the cartilage that is that shock absorber, but the cartilage absorbs that shock and pushes it down into the bone. So it's actually that subchondral bone that absorbs the brunt of the pressure, but you can see what happens with the cartilage when you're pressing on it is you're actually pushing moisture out of that joint and out of that cartilage and in back into that joint capsule. And if we have breakdown in that cartilage, it's not going to rebound back. We want that cartilage to squeeze and then rebound back. So that moisture is going to push out and suck back in, push out and suck back in. Um, we have a lot more compressive forces up here. And in that top layer, this superficial layer, we have a lot of water that gets pushed out. In this transitional zone, there's not as much fluid. And down here in the deep zone, there's very little fluid um, because where is it going to go, obviously? So hyaluronic acid, it's the backbone of those little bottle brushes here um, that are around, that floating around that chondrocyte. Um, and it's really, really important. It's a lubricant. It acts as a lubricant. And if we think about it, it's, a, it's almost like a clear gel. Um, it's linked to glucosamine. Um, and other uh, nutrients in the joint. That's why when I talk about joint supplements having a grouping of different ingredients and not just single ingredients, it's because they all work together. I think this shows much nicer, this proteoglycan complex, where the backbone, see that line that's holding everything together? That's hyaluronic acid here. This is the hyaluronic acid that's holding everything together. And then we've got proteins here. And then these bottle brush things, um, we've got keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate. Notice the sulfate word there, MSM, methyl sulfate. Um, and these are glycoaminoglycogens um, or GAGs as some people call them. But you can see the hyaluronic acid is what holds it all together. You don't have that hyaluronic acid. and nothing is really going to work. It's kind of like I talk about lysine being the first limiting amino acid and without enough lysine, it doesn't matter how much of all the other amino acids you have. If you don't have adequate amounts of hyaluronic acid, then you're really going to fail with a lot of your other um, joint ingredients. And then we have these larger blue structures, which are collagen fibers, and there are those chondrocytes right there. So it's long chains, um, and, and really, you know, we want to drive home that it's the it's the lubricant of the joint capsule. So there are actually three different types of cartilage. We mentioned there were different types of joints, but there are also different types of cartilage. There's what we call hyaline cartilage, and it's most commonly found um, on the ends of your ribs, so that cartilage that holds that joint together there. Uh, nose, um, in your trachea, um, it can be a precursor of, of some bone. Um, fibro cartilage um, is found in between the discs and the joint capsule and in ligaments. And then elastic cartilage is found um, it, what, it's what makes your ear, it's always also in your throat and also in your larynx. So that hyaline cartilage that we talked about, that's what's going to turn over at the end of those joints, that articular cartilage that's going to turn over and turn into bone. And you can see these Im images, how different these cartilages look. And what we're looking at under a microscope is the shape of those chondrocytes. So small, we've got in the fibrous cartilage. Look, it even looks like fi fibrous. It's, it, it's long, elongated, and you think about long fibers holding, um, having a lot of uh, holding capacity. And then we have these bigger um, chondrocytes here in this elastic cartilage, and you see all these collagen fibers here. You think about an elastic band having to have, you know, a, a mash of collagen fibers that can expand and contract and be very elastic plastic, fibrous, and then more of our rigid cartilage. This looks a lot more rigid, um, all very close together on the end of those joints. 
so that articular or, or hyaline cartilage, it's glistening white substance and it covers the end of the bone here. Here is our bone here, our subchondral bone, and that's that articular cartilage. And it, it, the health of this cartilage is the limiting factor on the amount of work a joint can perform when we're talking about athleticism in animals. What is making up this hyaline cartilage? So we have that surface here and we have those different zones. And this is just more of a graphic um, of those chondrocytes. There's a lot of water in there because that's going in and out. But again, as I mentioned, there is no blood vessels or nervous tissue, nerves in this hyaline cartilage. It's really just made up of these collagen fibers and these proteoglycan complexes, which the proteoglycan complexes are what? It's that hyaluronic acid backbone with your glucosamine and your other gags coming off it. Um, again, just another visual of these collagen fibers all meshed together and that looking at the different layers um, and, and looking deep here into that deeper cartilage down the bottom here and then the, that we call it a tide mark and that calcified cartilage and then the bone here underneath. Breaking it down a little bit more, chondroitin sulfate, uh, the bottle brush on here is the backbone, which is that hyaluronic acid. So there's water all floating around here. And when you press it, as we mentioned before, um, it forces out of that bottle brush. This is what we call the bottle brush. And it, that water pushes out. Um, and as that pressure goes away, then that water goes back into the cartilage and it re resumes its, its shape. So this is that interstitial fluid right here, that light blue. See, compression and rebounding. I know we've got a lot of repetition here, but you know, I, I like to uh, look at multiple different pictures because every time I see a different picture, I can um, get a different view and, and visualize it differently in my head. But this is healthy tissue. This is healthy, healthy cartilage. This is what we want it to see. Those collagen fibers, we've talked a lot about the hyaluronic backbone and with those proteoglycans, but the collagen fibers are also really, really important. Um, they form these kind of springs that offer that rebound effect in um, in that cartilage, and they're made up primarily of amino acids. So you know, protein is extremely critical that those and deep down into those amino acids it, to every system in the body, but also the joints. But these these collagen fibers, they form these tough little coils in the cartilage and give it that compression and rebound um, effect. And then when you have these shearing forces, it can actually disperse. Um, this is what, think of these as little springs and it's dispersing that pressure. So that subchondral bone, which is down here, it's between the calcified cartilage and the, you know, more mature bone. It's really important for two reasons. There are blood vessels that go in here and the blood vessels are going to help support and supply nutrients to that cartilage. Um, because as we mentioned, the cartilage has none of its own um, blood supply. So we want to be able to supply uh, nutrients to that cartilage from both sides. So we're going to do it from the subchondral bone and we're also going to do it from the top into through the, um, the synovial membrane and then to the synovial fluid. Um, it's a structure that ultimately absorbs the shock and forces that are acting on the cartilage. It's a bit of a myth that this, the cartilage does all of the shock absorption. The cartilage was, will absorb it, but push it down into the bone. So the bone has to be nice and healthy. And if it's not, that's where we get those bone chips because that it's not able to absorb that pressure um, uh, of whatever impact and it can chip off parts of that bone. 
cartilage is lubricated um, obviously by that synovial membrane and that hyaluronic acid plus those other glyco glucosamine those glycoproteins so what's what's causing joint increased joint pain you know there's just a multitude of different um, events that go into increased joint pain um, and this increased joint pain, maybe it should be in the middle here because it can be a cause and effect, you know, inflammation causes increased joint pain, then they're going to uh, redistribute their weight and maybe cause some limb dysfunction, decreased exercise. Um, you know, if we have this decrease in, in muscle tone, um, whether it be because they're gait is altered because they've got some joint pain somewhere then we're going to have poor muscular support you know if if the ligaments are stretched because again their 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 gait has changed uh, that increases joint instability and then that causes um, more joint damage itself because we don't have that really um, strong joint inflammation is really the um, cause of all of these problems um, so there are other things that we can't necessarily, you know, aren't necessarily performance related. So we think about joint um, disease and joint problems coming primarily from exercise and the amount of exercise that we're doing horses. But there are other things like poor confirmation or incorrect shoeing, because if we don't shoe our horses correctly, then that is going to alter um the joint stability it's going to alter the gait of the horse and then there are angular limb deformities that these horses are born with uh, as well as that poor conformation and you add on top of this the stress of exercise and riding and that kind of thing and it can really exacerbate these issues then um so what we need for normal joint structure is we need a really um, mechanically stable joint to prevent um, abnormal forces from acting on that joint. Uh, factors which lead to joint instability, these articular um, cartilage fractures or tendon ligament injuries, severe skin injuries sometimes. You don't think about the skin really being a something that's holding those joints together, but the skin around your whole body and also around your joints offers um, some support as well. You know, I've always said that inflammation is the, the cause of all things bad. And I, I found this graphic and I thought it was funny. But, you know, inflammation up here and we've got things that we're going to notice, heat and redness and swelling and pain and loss of function. These are all going to be symptoms of inflammation. But inflammation it itself um, then goes on to cause more detrimental effects. Inflammation is the process by which the body identifies, isolates, destroys, and removes an inflammagen or, or something that they don't want to have there, be it a microbe or a damaged tissue or a foreign substance. A lot of times with us, it's a damaged tissue exercising for example we damage those muscle fibers and then we're going to rebuild them to make that muscle stronger but we're damaging that tissue and then inflammation is going to occur it's going to bring all those nutrients to the area to try and heal it so inflammation is very normal it leads to normal it's a normal body function which leads to repair and wound he healing but it really can get out of control if the stimulus is strong enough and then not only does the horse have the the, you know, the the injury that it may have caused, but then we're feeding them a diet that's high in grains. So they've got inflammation there. Um, you know, there can be a inflammation coming from multiple other sources in their life as well, not just the immediate injury that you're trying to cheat, treat. Um, it you wonder why it swells and it really is due to vasodilation. It's this increase in blood flow 
which is going to cause heat because we've got now a lot more nutrients to that area and that's what's causing that redness because we're dilating these blood vessels increased permeability of those blood vessels and this is what's causing that swelling because we're trying to get those nutrients out into that area action of enzymes on the cell membrane um, and formation of these prostaglandins which is going to help with that pain um, and so if we think about in the joint what are we looking at what are we looking for well we're looking for heat pain so is the horse lame swelling so oftentimes you can't see redness um, and loss of function these are going to be things that we're looking at in a joint uh, to see potentially if inflammation is there um, and it progresses, if we don't remove that inflammation and it progresses, then we're going to have much more damage. So you can see here all these inflammatory cells filling in that space where we're supposed to have all that synovial fluid and it's starting to wear down at that cartilage, etc. So synovitis, itis always just means inflammation just like laminitis is inflammation of the laminae synovitis is inflammation of that synovial membrane so it's the early stages of inflammation and oftentimes when we see young horses that have a little swelling in their joints but there's no lameness um, it's just a little synovitis they're growing quickly they've got a little trauma um, and you can see right here in this joint capsule, this synovial membranes dilate um, and allow some of those um, inflammagens to get into that synovial fluid. White blood cells, which always come to an area, these are the, the kind of defenders of the body and they're going to try and get rid of any of that, whatever is causing the body to be inflamed. They're, they're the healers and they're going to rush into that synovial fluid, um, releasing these uh, free radicals, these oxygen radicals and enzymes. Uh, inflammation breaks down hyaluronic acid. It destroys the lubrication and that barrier function that we have so that synovial membrane is forming a barrier that's holding all that synovial fluid in there um, and then those inflamed synovial cells here in this synovial membrane also start to produce these uh, negative enzymes so we really want to keep inflammation low we don't want a lot of inflammation because we need to keep that joint capsule healthy we need to keep that synovial membrane healthy um, cell those those negative cells those free radicals uh, and enzymes now gain access to the cartilage that articular cartilage so they get in they get rid of some of that synovial fluid and now they have direct access to that hyaline or, or articular cartilage um, and they'll break down remember we we're talking about those collagen fibers we we're talking about those hyaluronic backbones those bottle brushes those proteoglycan complexes of those br bottle brushes and the collagen fibers and so these enzymes will start to break down down those um, chondrocytes start to produce their own enzymes to try and clean up the damage um, so causing more breakdown so you can see inflammation is really the the trigger it's the it kicks the first domino and then all of the dominoes just keep falling down um, if we have too much water if we don't have enough synovial fluid, if what happens is we don't, you know, when we're talking before about compliance of that of that cartilage, that compression and rebound, um, we don't have that anymore. If there's too much inflammation in there, um, if we have this a lot of stress on these chondrocytes, there's not enough nutrition getting in there, um, and those stress factors on that subchondral bone we're not going to get that compression and then rebound that when we talk about cartilage compliance it's that pressure and release of that uh, of the compression and rebound of that cartilage and that's really important um, that cartilage right up here it starts to fray it starts to break down um, and we can start to end up seeing deep clefts in that cartilage and it can progress to full thickness erosion and sometimes even those little um, parts of cartilage can break off um, 
this all these little bits of um, cartilage fragments floating around in the synovial fluid, the synovial fluid says, this is not supposed to be here. I don't want this here. And then it's kind of compounding that inflammation because now that synovial fluid um, starts to say, oh no, bring some inflammation here. We need to get rid of these um, particles that aren't supposed to be here. So it's just kind of a vicious cycle once that inflammation starts. Chondrocytes um, respond by dividing and clumping into groups, um, overwhelming damage and impaired metabolism. The chondrocytes com cannot replace themselves fast enough. So you can see over here underneath the watermarks, you can see that that cartilage starts to break off and it just can't repair itself fast enough. We know that cartilage is continually turning over, but in, in cases where we've got damage, it just can't repair large scale damage like this, it cannot regenerate fast enough. Um, and the net loss of cut cartilage matrix um, is a hallmark sign of joint disease or osteoarthritis. So we can't replace that cartilage fast enough. And so we have these exposed areas of bone. You can see here, this is that nice white cartilage and there's a huge tear in it. Um, and these are, and you can, it's hard to see in this photograph, but there's micro fractures in the top part of that subchondral bone as well. Um, when we have the, the, the healing of that bone, um, you can get bone spurs. You can have little bumps in that bone. So that's not a, not a nice, even surface that's got a nice, even surface of cartilage on it. Now there are some bone spurs that can cause pain or these chips here, these osteophytes. Um, you see those bone spurs. Um, bam damaged bone cannot absorb the shock normally and may fragment causing these osteochondral bone chips. Healthy joint. Everything's nice, nicely lined, damaged joint. You see that articular cartilage has really started to break down. It's floating around in the synovial fluid. The synovial fluid's redder than normal, and we've just got overall swelling of the whole joint. Just another graphic here of nice intact synovial membrane. We saw this earlier, joint capsule on the outside, pretty nice articular cartilage. And then here you see, um, you know, this breakdown here articular cartilage really worn away. We've got these osteophytes or bone spurs, um, eroded cartilage and very inflamed synovial membrane. It's much thicker. Abnormal synovial fluid. Um, pain, damaged subchondral bone, um, primarily because of those little bone spurs, those chips also comes from swelling around here, pressure and fluid in that joint capsule. As we mentioned before, those white blood, blood cells, they're the healers, they're gonna come to the area, but if they get out of control, then we actually get destroyed tissue. This is just a series of pictures that I thought was really neat. Again, that really nice, clean, um, healthy joint. Now, as the osteoarthritis starts to wear away, and this is what we're going to see in our more mature, older horses that have been exercising, you just start to see breaks, breaking down, cracking in the surface of that cartilage. Um, gaps in the cartilage expand, exposing the bone itself. Um, now we have these fluid pockets as that joint is, um, you know, trying to repair itself that bone is trying to repair itself and now we get these little um, cysts forming bone chips as those bones are chipping off and this is permanent damage that you really can't re uh, restore repair of cartilage um, to full thickness um, is, is pretty impossible after you've worn it away to this extent here. So yeah, when, when full thickness loss of cartilage occurs, this is permanent. Um, hyaline cartilage, that healthy cartilage that they're born with, um, is replaced with 
that less resilient fibro cartilage. That fibro cartilage just doesn't have the same qualities as the hyaline cartilage. Um, you know, not even drugs like Adequan, which I know gets a, a rap for being a miracle cure, can treat or replace lost cartilage. Lost cartilage is lost cartilage. So the repair of cartilage before, so the reduction of inflammation before we have all that damage, before the full thickness loss is the goal. So down to some of those ingredients that we actually put into our joint supplements. Glucosamine. It's part of that bottle brush that we looked at. It's important. It should be in a joint supplement. 4 to 18 grams a day is what the research has shown us should be in. Now, if you look, if you have your catalog in front of you um, and you look at the amount of glucosamine that's in our Optimum Flex, for example, glucosamine sulfate, glucosamine um, hydrochloride, add those two together and in one ounce you've got 4,000 milligrams, which is four grams. So what you'll notice um, is in our Optimum Flex, as we go through these different ingredients, we're going to be at the lower end because if you want to load the dose, obviously we don't want to put 18 grams in and then you're loading the dose and having 26 grams in there and that's pointless. So we're going to be at the lower end of ideal Anywhere in here is where research has suggested, um, but we're going to be on that end. And then as you load the horse up, um, you can have more and more. But there's a lot of equine research on glucosamine. As we said, it supports that cartilage production, important for joint comfort. But now you can visualize where it is in the joint. It makes up that bottle brush, but it's held together by hyaluronic acid. It helps to inhibit some of those inflammatory mediators. Why on earth is that important? Because I just spent 30 minutes showing you why inflammation is the beginning of everything bad. And once you get a lot of inflammation, it's really hard to, to re reduce that. Chondroitin sulfate. Sulfate was another part of that backbone, those bottle brushes. Um, and chondroitin sulfate, we've got one gram. So here we are again in that in that range. And that's in the maintenance dose. But if you want to load the dose, you're getting, you know, two, three ounces a day. Um, supports the production and slows the breakdown of cartilage. All of these things are improved joint comfort inhibits inflammatory mediators. Again, very, very important. Glucosamine and chondroitin have been shown to work together because they're both in that bottle brush matrix, that proteoglycan matrix. Um, and yes, obviously we've done a lot of equine research. Hyaluronic acid. 100 milligrams a day used in a particular study um, 150 milligrams is usually what we uh, recommend and decreasing in swelling. But you you saw how important hyaluronic acid was in the joint. It's the backbone of that bottle brush, which makes up that articular hyaline cartilage. It's extremely important. Um, MSM or methyl sulfomethane, um, about... Uh, eight grams a day, we've got 8,500. So again, we're when you look at other joint supplements and you're like, well, they've got a lot more than us, why is that more, is that more beneficial? We are well within the researched range. There is no reason to put excessive amounts of these ingredients in there if they're just going to be wasted. So we are in the researched range. Now, yucca and devil's claw obviously are not naturally occurring in the body. These are um, naturally occurring in plants, in herbs, and there's a wide range of different doses recommended. Um, but it's very difficult when looking at yucca because yucca comes as um, non-concentrated and then it also comes in an extract form. And we put yucca shitagira extract in our yucca five-way 
product um, and it's very very concentrated so to compare that to some other products that just have the less concentrated product in there and say well theirs has more in it it's really comparing apples to oranges you need to make sure that you're um, comparing both together and anywhere really between a um, uh, hundred milligrams to ten thousand milligrams or ten grams and we're right in there in the middle at about in the yucca five way having about 468 grams in for, uh, 468 milligrams um, in that yucca five way pack in one ounce so has some mild anti-inflammatory properties as does the devil's claw now obviously the devil's claw is in the herbal respond and if you are competing in sanctioned events that do drug testing, devil's claw is a banned substance. But let's say you have an older horse that you're just looking for some natural anti-inflammatory, some natural joint um, pain relief, um, then there is no problem with feeding devil's claw to that horse because he's not exercising. You're not the the reason why we certain substances are banned is because they have been proven to maybe mask some pain so obviously devil's claw has some benefit because it's a banned substance it can mask some pain um, by by masking by helping some of that inflammation but um, we really make need to make sure that uh, we're not feeding devil's claw to any pregnant mares um, and also not to any horses that are competing and getting drug tested so I didn't mention the high, high victory because it's just straight hyaluronic acid. And whilst 10 grams is only is going to give you 125 milligrams of hyaluronic acid, um, you can feed as many scoops as you want. One scoop is going to give you 125 milligrams of um, hyaluronic acid. So. Optimum Flex Plus, it's a combination of chondroitin, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, MSM, because you've seen them all now. You've seen where they all fit into the joint, and they help alleviate inflammation because inflammation is terrible. Um, hyaluronic acid to increase that joint synovial, synovial fluid, also decrease inflammation. Um, yucca helps because it's got the yucca shitagira extract to reduce inflammation, but it's also got copper and manganese. Remember those um, collagen fibers? What do you think is really important for collagen fibers and those keratin fibers? Copper, manganese. Herbal Respond again has um, concentrated levels of the um, yucca shitagira extract it's actually got 3,000 milligrams um, and also has that devil's claw so be careful with pregnant mares and um, also has vitamin C so I will open it up to questions let me Okay, Qu first question, bone chip in the rear fetlock, x-ray confirmed, x injected with good results, currently on OS and OFP, should stay on that or something else, total performance plus um, with the joint. Now, the total performance plus, unless you're feeding the um, you know, loaded dose, the three ounces a day, you're just going to get a maintenance dose of joint supplement. It's not going to be, you're not able to do the loading dose of joint supplement. So with a horse like that, where there's an actual um, damage that has occurred, you're better off buying yourself a separate supply of the Optimum Flex Plus so that you could give a little bit more than just the maintenance dose. Um, what can't can or can't be given to a broodmare, and what? Well, the only thing that you can't give a broodmare is devil's claw. Everything else in here you can give to a broodmare. And there's nothing in our catalog that you couldn't give a horse that had OCD, other than if it was super fat, you wouldn't want to give it oil because it's just going to make it fatter. Okay, I am going to end our recording. Appreciate you all being on.